Well, folks, a very warm welcome to Trinity at Four. We're so thrilled to have you with us today. A particular welcome if you are a child. We love having children with us. Um, the first 15 minutes, we hope, is particularly accessible for you. So if you're a young person, please do stick around. And if you are a grown-up with young children in the house, why don't you go and grab them? Because hopefully the first 10, 15 minutes will be particularly engaging uh, for them. Um, if you're here for the first time, then welcome. We love having newcomers. Uh, we meet all together for about 35 or 40 minutes, and then uh, uh, regulars go off into smaller groups. And if you're new and would like to be in one of, involved in one of those as well, then uh, that would be a very easy thing to organise. So just send me a, a message on the chat. Um, in a moment, I'm going to begin in a prayer, but I just wanted to say that um, a much-loved member of our church family is turning 80 tomorrow, I gather. Um, this is Bob Summers. So I wondered, um, Peter, I'm looking at you, our techno man, can you temporarily unmute everyone so we can all shout a very quick, very quick happy birthday? <laughs> okay, we're all unmuted. Should we all shout a big happy birthday? Happy birthday! Okay, Bob, we love you very much and hope you have a wonderful 80th birthday celebration tomorrow. I'm going to pray for our service and then we're going to sing and we're going to have a couple of songs. Um, you're welcome to sing along or if you prefer just to listen in, that's fine as well. So let me, uh, let me pray. Father, we thank you so much for the ability to meet like this in the absence of being able to meet physically. As we've been praying week by week, we pray that you would help us to fix our eyes on Jesus. Yeah. And as we do that, we run with perseverance through these days. And we pray that for Jesus' sake. Amen.
I'll read you some about how big, how big and strong and mighty God is. And the next bit of our story in Exodus is all about the showdown between God and Pharaoh. Who's the one who's really in charge? Who's the biggest? Who's the most powerful? So we've had our warm-ups. We're all well stretched. And this bit of our story today is like the warm-up. It's the first showdown between God and Pharaoh. And it looks like it's a win for Pharaoh. God's people are made to work even harder. But God promises to Moses that he's still in charge. He is going to rescue his people. God says, I am the Lord. I keep my promises. I'm bigger and stronger and mightier than Pharaoh. Nothing can stop my plan from happening. And the thing is, God's still bigger and stronger and mightier than anything in the world. Nothing can God stop God's plan to rescue his people, and nothing can stop God's plan to rescue us. And we can be sure of that, because we have the evidence in our Bibles that Jesus really did die and come back to life. And that shows us that God is bigger and stronger and mightier than anyone or anything else. Nothing can mess up God's plans. It was true for Moses and Pharaoh thousands of years ago, and it's true for us now. And that's really, really good news. And we're going to read about that good news now in our Bible passage. Steve is going to read it for us. So let me unmute you, Steve. Unmute. Oops. So Steve will read it. It should come up on screen for us as well. And do follow along yourselves with that Bible now. Um, once it comes up on, on screen, Steve, all over to you. Brilliant. So we're going to start in Exodus 4.29 to 5.9, and then 5.19 to 6.1, also in Exodus as well. So starting off at chapter 4, verse 29 in Exodus. Moses and Aaron brought together all the elders of the Israelites, and Aaron told them everything the Lord had said to Moses. He also performed the signs before the people, and they believed. And when they heard that the Lord was concerned about them and had seen their misery, they bowed down and worshipped. Afterwards, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Let my people go, so that they may hold a festival to me in the wilderness. Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord, that I should obey him and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. Then they said, The God of the Hebrews has met with us. Now let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God, or he may strike us with plagues or with the sword. But the king of Egypt said, Moses and Aaron, why are you taking the people away from their labor? Get back to your work. Then Pharaoh said, Look, the people of the land are now numerous, and you are stopping them from working. That same day, Pharaoh gave this order to the slave drivers and overseers in charge of the people. You are no longer to supply the people with straw for making bricks. Let them go and gather their own straw, but require them to make the same number of bricks as before. Don't reduce the quota. They are lazy. That is why they are crying out. Let us go and sacrifice to our God. Make the work harder for the people so that they keep working and pay no attention to lies. And now 519. The Israelite overseers realized they were in trouble when they were told, you are not to reduce the number of bricks required of you for each day. When they left Pharaoh, they found Moses and Aaron waiting to meet them. And they said, may the Lord look on you and judge you. You have made us obnoxious to Pharaoh and his officials and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. Moses returned to the Lord and said, Why, Lord, why have you brought trouble on this people? Is this why you sent me? Ever since I went to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has brought trouble on this people, and you have not rescued your people at all. Then the Lord said to Moses, Now you will see 
what I will do to Pharaoh. Because of my mighty hand, he will let them go. Because of my mighty hand, he will drive them out of this country. This is the word of the Lord. Brilliant, Steve. Thanks so much. And should we just pray as we look at God's word together? Let's pray. So, Father, we pray that you'd give us focus just for 20 minutes or so. Uh, Lord, all the distractions going on in the house, with all the distractions going on in our own minds, uh, Lord, we pray you'd help us to put those to one side. And we just expect you to be speaking particular truths to our hearts as we look at your word, the Bible now. And we pray that for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, I recently finished reading um, 1984, and I don't know if you've read that book before, but George Orwell invites us to imagine this, um, this kind of dystopian world where the government has seized a kind of godlike control over every citizen. And the symbolic head of state, Big Brother, keeps his watchful, uh, watchful eye on every, every movement. And the story follows a guy called Winston. He's a kind of regular guy. He's a loyal party member who one day joins what he thinks is a resistance movement against the state. Now, without spoiling the plot for, um, for anyone who's not read it, it doesn't go well for Winston. And uh, Orwell does a brilliant job at painting a picture of the utter helplessness of the situation, okay, the utter dominance of the regime. And I think that's what it must have felt like to live through Exodus 5 that we've just had read so well for us. If you've, uh, if you've only just joined us, you, here's a little kind of catch up. So far, God has commissioned Moses to set the enslaved Israelites free from the Egyptians. Um, he, he goes after a bit of persuasion, and we see at the beginning of our reading today that the Israelite elders enthusiastically respond. But then, just as the resistance begins to mobilize, I mean, it's heartbreaking how ruthlessly and how completely it is crushed. And by the end of Exodus 5, the Israelites have turned against Moses and Moses has turned against God. And it looks like the power of Egypt is unassailable. So what's Exodus 5 and Exodus 6 all about then? Well, actually, God is not primarily teaching us here about totalitarian regimes, although it does say a little bit about those. Mainly, he's teaching us about the nature of redemption. Perhaps we might just have our, our slide up. Here are a couple of key verses that we get a little later on in, in chapter six, if we could put those up on the screen. This is God responding to Moses. He says, therefore, say to the Israelites, I am the Lord and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people and I'll be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. Okay, this is what's going on. It's teaching us about redemption, God freeing his people that they might belong to him. That's what redemption means. It means to free someone or something that it might belong to you. That's what God is doing for his people. And, and the God of the Bible is a God of redemption, a God who frees people that we might belong to him. And Exodus, we've been seeing together, is the big Old Testament story of redemption. But, you know, it was only ever intended by God as a picture for us of an even bigger redemption that he would achieve one day through Jesus. And that means now for us, as we look at this Old Testament story of redemption, actually it gives us principles, it teaches us about the nature of our redemption through Jesus. So that's what we're going to see together today. And, and three headlines for us as we, as we do that. The first one is this, we are helpless in our captivity. So Moses turns up, it's good news, he says to the elders. I mean, you can imagine them gathered around that they are, they've been in slavery for decades. God has sent me to set you free. And, and amazingly, they believe him. 
Just imagine how powerful that hope must have felt as they headed back to their families that evening. But then very quickly, it all seems to unravel. So Moses goes to Pharaoh and this is his pitch for freedom. Pharaoh said, who is, this is how Pharaoh responds after Moses, um, Moses says, let my people go. Pharaoh says, who is the Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? And you might think, well, from Pharaoh's perspective, fair question. I do not know the Lord and I will not let Israel go. Then uh, Moses and Aaron said, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Now let us take this three day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to our God that he may, or he may strike us with plagues. Not quite sure what Moses is doing. That's not exactly what God had told him to say. But nonetheless, the king of Egypt said, Moses and Aaron, why are you taking the people away from their labor? Get back to your work. Then Pharaoh said, look, the people of the land are now numerous and you are stopping them from working. So here's what's gone on. I mean, Moses, I sorry, God has spoken a word of freedom. And then Pharaoh speaks, and it's a word of oppression. Now, here's the thing. Which word looks more effective? Which word looks more powerful? See, Pharaoh speaks his word, and and the lives of hundreds of thousands of people are instantly made more miserable just by what Pharaoh decided power. And verse 19, I think, must have felt like an understatement. The Israelite overseers realized they were in trouble when they were told you are not to reduce the number of bricks required for each day. I mean, trouble is an understatement. Brutal slavery. But what could they do? All of their dreams and hopes for freedom. Utterly powerless before the power and strength of the regime. We're helpless in our captivity. And, 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 you know, the amazing story of redemption told in the New Testament has exactly the same starting point. Helplessness. Here's how it puts it in the New Testament. The Apostle Paul, you see, at just the right time, while we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Or, or, or Jesus, this is how he puts it, when his bewildered disciples ask, who then can be saved? With man, this is impossible says Jesus, but not with God. So we were powerless, uh, not under a totalitarian regime. We, we were powerless, says the Bible, under our sin. Now, that's just a, another way of speaking about a natural tendency that all of us people are trapped in. It's an, it's, it's, it's an anti-God way of thinking, of speaking, of living. And if you want a graphic picture to show you what that looks like, then Exodus is, is, is the thing that gives it to us, slavery. It's both inescapable and it's um, destructive. Our, our, our sin is inescapable. I mean, look at the world around us. Have, have we people fundamentally changed for the better over the years and generations and centuries? Or have we just got more intelligent and worked out more intelligent ways of doing the things that we've always done? Okay, look at your own life. You know, so, I mean, I don't know if it's just me, but don't you find that just the same old issues come up to the surface? The same old temptations plague us. The, the same old selfishness rears its, its ugly, ugly head. The power of sin, like the Egyptian oppressor, is, is inescapable. But it's destructive as well. I mean, the, the Israelites cried out under it. And it's interesting, you know, Jesus refers to our sin um, as a burden. It's an interesting image, that, isn't it? Now, wonderfully, as we'll see shortly, he offers to carry that burden for us. But doesn't that language ring true? The burden of our sin that weighs us down and we find it hard to escape it. It's destructive. Patterns of thinking, patterns of relating that are not life-giving. But nonetheless, we go back to them. And ultimately, the, our, our, our sin, the Bible tells us, leads towards a total separation from God and all that is good. This is where 
the story of redemption begins. Helplessness. We're trapped. And as the sun sets on an utterly despondent Moses and an utterly helpless people, any hope of self-salvation had been crushed under the sheer power of the oppressor. And you know, helplessness is how every personal story of redemption begins. Now, some people imagine that being a Christian is about seeking to be a better person. Some people imagine being a Christian is, is about adopting a moral outlook or a set of religious practices, but that's not a Christian. That's someone who thinks that they're a nice person. And actually they are being hopelessly over-optimistic about human nature and about the condition of our own hearts. You see, a Christian is someone who has realized that under their sin, they are helpless. They cannot escape it. They cannot hope to have any relationship with God or any hope for eternal life in their own strength. And that's when a person's personal story of redemption begins. Because that's when they stop looking to themselves and begin looking to God. Okay, so that, that's our first point. We are all under a captivity. We're all captives. Here's our second point, though. Our only hope of redemption lies with God. Our only hope of redemption lies with God. This is how um, God answers Moses when he goes to report back what's going on. Then the Lord says, uh, said to Moses, now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. Because of my mighty hand, he will let them go. Because of my mighty hand, he will drive them out of his country. See the repetition there, because of my mighty hand. Or as Jesus said, what is impossible with man is possible with God. But as I read on now from, from, from that second paragraph, See the phrase that is repeated like a hammer blow that God speaks to Moses. I am the Lord. So God also said to Moses, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself fully known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan when they were resided as foreigners. Moreover, I've heard their groaning of the Israelites whom the Egyptians were enslaving. And I have remembered my covenant. Therefore, say to the Israelites, I am the Lord and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people and I will be your God. Then you will know that I, the Lord, your God, who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians and I will bring you to the land I swore with uplifted hands to give to Abraham, to Isaac and to Jacob. I will give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. I am the Lord. Remember, it's, 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 it's not about you, God says to Moses. I am the Lord. Remember, I have promised to redeem you. I am the Lord. Remember, I love you and am at work. I am the Lord. Remember, Pharaoh may be too powerful for you, but he's not for me. I am the Lord. You know, that word I comes nearly 20 times in this short paragraph. Can you see the point? Yes, by ourselves, we are helpless. But God has promised to work redemption. To free us from our destructive slavery to sin. That we might belong to him. And, you know, nothing will stop him from carrying out that redemption. It didn't stop him in the days of Moses. Pharaoh couldn't stop him. And as for the Israelites, so it is for us. You know, Jesus came. We did nothing to bring him down. Jesus loved us. We did nothing to deserve that love. Jesus died on the cross facing the punishment that should have been asked for our sin. We did nothing to merit such costly sacrifice. Jesus rose from the dead. You know, we can do nothing in the face of death ourselves. Jesus offers all who trust him total forgiveness from our sin. New resurrection. We've done nothing. We can do nothing. But Jesus has done it all. 
In fact, all we're called to do is to respond to Jesus in faith. That just means to say, gosh, I, I, I realize now I, I need this redemption too. Now I, I can't do it myself. Jesus, thank you. Please free me. Take me to belong to yourself. I don't know if it's just me, but, but then you find that we people are so prone to assuming that we can just do it all ourselves. Actually, that attitude is the greatest hindrance to someone becoming a genuine Christian. Of course, there are plenty of religious churchgoers who assume it's all about being a good person and trying your best. But actually, that, that's, that's not a Christian. Because a Christian is someone who has thrown themselves exclusively on the mercy of Jesus. And, you know, such is God's love for us that, some, uh, that, that, that sometimes, as he did for the Israelites back then, he will lovingly lead us through a season of life that reveals to us how helpless we are, how in need of redemption. And he does that, friends, not to crush us but so that we might put all of our hope and confidence, not in ourselves, but in him. While we were still powerless, Christ died for us. And where does that leave us? Well, it leaves us with no place to boast. It leaves us with no moral smugness or superiority, only an overflowing thankfulness for what God has done for us. Christian believer, I wonder, when was the last time that your heart exploded with praise what well, could it be that you have forgotten how helpless we were without christ and the mighty hand that through him secured your redemption okay so we are we are helpless uh, enslaved in our sin our only hope of redemption lies with god and so just finally a few thoughts keep looking to god keep looking to god you see, the experience of the Israelites not only illustrates our helplessness, it also illustrates a very common experience in the Christian life, and that is spiritual attack. The story of the Bible as a whole makes it very clear that uh, behind Pharaoh lies a spiritual foe who is opposed to all God's plans and God's people, Satan. And from the beginning, he has been undermining God's work. And so in this case, it's, in, it's interesting, isn't it? Redemption begins. Moses calls the elders. It gets going. And what happens straight away? There's counterattack. OK, and that's really summed up well in these verses, verses 9 to 12. Moses reported to the Israelites, but they did not listen to him because of their discouragement and harsh labor. Then the Lord said to Moses, go tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the Israelites go. And what does Moses say? He says, look, if the Israelites won't listen to me, why would Pharaoh listen to me since I speak, speak with with faltering lips, we've heard that one before. And it's so tragic because they end up rejecting the one who was their only hope of freedom. Now, wonderfully, they didn't keep doing that. But you see, that's, that's what this, this spiritual attack seeks to do, to discourage in order to draw away. And that kind of spiritual attack continues to be commonplace in the Christian life. You know, I've seen it tragically so many times before. You see the light of redemption beginning to fill someone's eyes. They see Jesus and they, they get a real sense of hope and freedom in all that they see of him. They make a start in the Christian life. And, you know, then there's the counterattack. Life suddenly becomes harder, not easier. Persecution, perhaps, for our faith. We lose our job. Our health gives way. And, and you know, people can end up just turning away from the only one who can set us free. Perhaps saying, oh, Jesus has done nothing for me. Following him has only made life harder. Spiritual attack. Actually, it can happen at any time in the Christian life. The spiritual attack of discouragement that turns us away from Jesus. And I just wonder if some of us, for some of us, this is a real danger at the moment. We feel defeated and discouraged and we are just hanging on to our Christian faith by an absolute thread, we're under spiritual attack. Well, what do we do in those situations? Well, we keep looking to God. That's how God encourages Moses to respond to his discouragement. I am the Lord. 
It's interesting, you know, God tells him nothing new in Exodus 6. It's all a complete repeat of the commission that he gave him in Exodus 3. Because actually the issue wasn't that Moses didn't know what he needed to know. He'd just taken his eyes off the Lord. He needed reminding. He needed to put his eyes back on the Lord. It's the same for us. Let us run with perseverance. The race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, fixing our eyes on him. Friends, if we feel discouraged and defeated under the strain of life at the moment, just like at those Israelites, brother, brothers, sisters, I feel it myself. We must keep looking to God. Remember who he is. None of his promises have ever failed. The redemption through Christ is assured. And whatever you do, don't give up. Well, yes, we are helpless in our captivity. That's where every redemption story starts. Our only hope is God. And so through all the trials and every spiritual attack, friends, can I encourage us? Keep looking to him. Well, I'm going to I'm going to pray uh, in just a moment, just to say if there are any questions on the back of that, um, just after our prayers in a moment, um, I'll 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 try and address any of those. And uh, uh, you could perhaps just uh, put that in the chat as an individual question. You'll see um, the host is titled questions. So you can do that if you've got any questions about it today. Uh, but for now, I'll pray and then hand straight over to Leslie who will lead us in, 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 in a few more prayers. So, Father, thank you for, um, for your word. Thank you above all for the redemption that we have through Jesus. And we were helpless in our captivity. And yet Jesus has redeemed us. And through every, um, every trial, every spiritual attack, we pray that we'd keep fixing our eyes uh, on him. And we pray that for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Over to Leslie. So let's come before God in prayer because we certainly need it at the moment. Father God, we just come before you humbly and we know our lives haven't been perfect. We know that we've been feeling sometimes struggling, sometimes finding it really difficult. Lord, you know the truth of who we are. You know how our particular struggles and we just bring them all to you now. We lay our burdens at your feet and ask Jesus that you will renew us, that you will forgive us, that you will cover us and you will lift us up. Lord, we thank you for the half term, this coming term, for the break for the children, the break for the mums and dads as well, and the teaching. Father God, we pray for the children. We pray, Lord, that you'll protect them and keep them in your care. We pray that you'll, you'll keep them from worry and fear of the unknown and fear of what's happening. We pray that you'll reassure their hearts and their spirits that you are the God of love. And you are the God who is strong and you are going to do amazing things in their lives, even at a time like this. Father, we pray for teenagers who are really struggling this time. We've been hearing today from a friend how, how there's so many tensions with the young people that are, are indoors and, and not being able to do what they'd normally do. And we ask Jesus for those who love you that you will give them an extra helping of your grace and your love just to really know you close to them and to be able to renew their relationship with you so that when all this is lifted, Lord, they will go out stronger and not weaker. We pray for ourselves, Jesus. You know the struggles we have in our families. You know how we miss being able to hug our friends. You know, Lord, how church doesn't seem quite the same. But Jesus, we bring our limitations, we bring the ways we're feeling before you, and we ask for your strength in us, Lord, even in our weakness, even in our brokenness, even in our feeling sometimes of being lost. We pray for your closeness and your a very sense of you being part of our lives, that we will be able to share the story of this together when we speak. Lord, you are the God who is in charge. You are the God who will rescue. You are the God who is, 
who knows what is happening, and I pray that you will speak that word into our hearts. We pray for others who are struggling, Lord. We know some people are struggling incredibly at the moment, and we just bring the mental health of this nation and others before you and ask, Lord, for your healing and your support, supporting, especially of those who love you. We pray for the many churches who are meeting virtually and like us, us at the moment. We pray for the ministers. We pray, Lord, for those who are bringing your word faithfully week after week. Jesus, we thank you that you're here, even in times of strife and trouble. Often we hear this as things that are far away. At the moment, it's right part of our lives. And Lord, we ask that you will help us to be conquerors in you and to be stronger. Bless the families, Lord. Bless the homes. And we want to bless your name and bring ourselves and say we trust you. We trust that you're at work. We trust that you're a strong God in our lives. And we thank you. And then we're going to say the Lord's Prayer together. And we're going to start, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today your daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Well, folks, that brings our service uh, today to an end. Just before you zoom off to your cluster groups, just two things to mention. Uh, we have our daily rock. That's a 10 minute Bible thought from me every morning at eight o'clock. Just to say that will happen tomorrow morning. I know it's a bank holiday, but I figure perhaps a few more people might be there for around. So do zoom in at eight o'clock tomorrow for that. We're thinking about a really key topic. How can we share the good news in a coronavirus world? We'll be sending all work week thinking through how we can do that effectively. We'd love to see you there at eight o'clock tomorrow morning and the rest of the week. And just to say as well, another thing which I'm going to just have a, a little trial at, which I'd love your support in, um, next Sunday from 11 a.m. till 1 p.m., I'm going to go and set myself up with a sign in Market Square um, and uh, be available for anyone who wants to have a chat and a pray. I've got a kind of decent poster and stuff um, just to try and communicate that although our church buildings are closed, we are very much available for our community. So that's going to be on Sunday. We'll put a bit more information, hopefully, in the newsletter about that as well. But I'd love your prayers for that as well. I hope it'd be a great way of connecting with our community. And if you're around as well, then do pop along. It'd be lovely to have a chance and a pray with any of you as well. So hopefully that'll be Sundays from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Um, each, each week. I'm going to just close our time with a prayer and then I'll zoom us all off to our, to our cluster groups. Let's pray. And say, so, Father, thank you that you are the God of redemption. And that any, uh, no matter how hopeless a situation might be, you can work and will work to bring redemption as we come to you helplessly and trusting alone in you. Help us to do that, we pray, um, even this week. In Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>